Hi everyone, welcome back to Soundcheck. Um, this is another talk on labels. This is actually our first instalment talking about record labels and I'm here with Justine from Church Road Records. Justine, how's it going? Hey, thanks for having me. No worries. Um, so just to get us started, um, can you tell everybody listening today and watching today a little bit about yourself um, and Church Road Records as a label? Um, so I guess like my background in music, like I um, I really did an animation degree and found out I hated doing animation because it was tedious. Um, and I like ended up interning at a record label um, straight out of university and uh, I liked that a lot better. Um, so I've been doing that ever since really. Um, so I started off as like an intern um, and then worked my way up to a label manager. And as of last year, I've started uh, running my own label with my husband, Church Road Records. Um, and yeah, we've been a full-time label since September last year. Um, so in the peak of a pandemic, which is quite fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so no better time than Brexit and a pandemic to start a label up properly. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, I mean, lots of people watching us are going to relate to the whole pandemic crisis, particularly in the music industry. But I think you touched on something interesting there. So obviously the young people watching, they're going to be some people who want to be in bands, some people who don't. And I think you've just said there that you interned and then you ended up being a label manager. For me, that sounds like a big jump. And I think that's going to be really interesting for everybody watching at home. How did you land an internship and how did you work your way up to, to becoming a label manager? So I landed an internship by just sort of like going to shows and like local shows, especially um, like sort of in, in main cities or if there's anywhere like, you know, that's got enough like sort of going on scene wise. Um, and I ended up just sort of knowing people because, you know, after a while you start noticing the same people go to the same shows as you. So it's only polite to say hello. Um, and yeah, through that I met um, my, um, my ex boss um, at a label um, at a label showcase, funnily enough, that he, of his label. Um, and yeah, like from there, like I just realized they were doing an internship. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so to be honest, it's quite a tough decision a lot of the time. Um, so I was like, I'll give it a go. Like I was in a band, um, well, the same band I'm in now, but I was in a band at the time as well. And it just made sense to utilize what I've learned being in my own band to help other bands out um and yeah so I literally just did things like um packaging records customer emails I did a bit of graphic design I think you'll find that it's really useful to have a bit of everything on your CV in terms of like being able to do things like photoshop video editing especially with small labels um because the team's so small there's not really a specific job for one person that's only when you get into bigger labels so that's the case um so yeah like I literally just did that and then after a few years I just sort of got promoted to like being part-time label assistant and then I went to full-time and yeah like just stuck around really so I did it like eight years I think after about four years of being there I worked my way up to label manager um you just kind of do it by being consistent and you know turning up on time just genuinely caring about your work because like I think you know people notice you know when someone's putting hard work in and um and yeah, you just got to be reliable, really, like with any job. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what label was that? At? Uh, it was at Holy Royal Records. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing. I think, you know, like I said, there's going to be a whole range of people in completely different situations watching this. Um, but there's definitely going to be plenty of people who, you know, maybe leaving a degree or leaving college, say, who are looking to get their foot in the door, so to speak, as much as that expression is overused. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of invaluable because I think even an internship, you know, sometimes seems almost unattain unattainable for, for people. Um, so you spoke about having a, a, bit of, a bit of everything on your CV. The train's going by, so if you heard that. <laughs> um, yeah, a bit of everything on your CV. How do you balance that? What's the, what's the balancing act between not looking like, you know, you're, you're squeezing everything onto your CV to, to, you know, look at me, I can do a bit of everything to being employable, so to speak? I think just like, try and keep your especially when you're just coming out of uni keep your cv one page it doesn't need to be any bigger than that um and then in your cover letter that's where you can really sort of show off what you can do um you know that also only needs to be one page even if you've got lots of skills just go like have a look at what the label does on a day-to-day -day basis and go right i can do their instagram stories i'm really good at out you know knowing about algorithms on igtv or you know all those kind of things and that's where like the cover letter kind of comes in handy like if you spend most of your time on your cover letter that's mainly what people are interested in I mean 
like when I was looking at intern CVs, I wasn't interested in what you got in your GCSE. Um, like if you bothered to write a cover letter, a lot of people don't even bother with that. Like that's an immediate red flag because you can't be bothered to write a few paragraphs then, you know, you might not, it's, you know, hard work being an intern, you tend to sort of do the stuff that, you know, the other members staff don't tend to have time to do, but a good internship should uh, in turn teach you a lot. Um, so make, watch out for that. And you're not just being copy person. <laughs> cool. So yeah, that's great. I mean, as I say, you know, there's, I think sometimes it seems like unattainable for people. And I think, you know, even for me, as someone in my position, that's really useful. So um, anyway, let's get on to Church Road Records, which is of course, what you're doing up to date. How has it been the last 12 months in the middle of a pandemic running a record label? Stressful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been, do you know, it's been really good though, because I think um, although we've lost things like shop sales because they've not been open, I feel like people really, really miss going to shows. So what they're doing instead is they're sort of like looking to support bands and labels elsewhere, like especially online. So I feel like online sales have kind of gone up which is really good um and yeah like I don't think it's really changed much I mean we've definitely like gone more online centric before we used to like go to like festivals and have stalls and stuff and have more a lot more of a public face but obviously now it's a very much internet face um mm -hmm. I'm quite interested in that like I feel there's more of an emphasis on how important social media is and especially newsletters like emails like personalizing things um yeah like most parts been okay like we've done better than like the live music industry that's for sure because that's been, that's been awful <laughs> absolutely yeah um yeah I mean it's been an interesting time for everybody but as you say you know you you started you joined Church Road full-time only last year so your experience there has been very limited to the pandemic I think do you think that's something um that you've seen like a, maybe a trend in people perhaps being more generous you know with lots of people furloughed thinking oh, I'm you know this is a great time to you know put my hands in my pockets and invest or well, not invest but pay some money and support the bands and, and the causes that you know that I care about 100% yeah like I feel like it's been a more charitable time anyway um as well like across the board not just limited to music um but yeah it's been quite good because like the people who are fortunate enough to sort of have enough money from being furloughed obviously they don't have money to spend on travel and things anymore so they, you know they might even just have a bit more income just to spend on records and you're stuck in your house next to your record player so yeah absolutely um yeah I spoke to um some artists recently and, and they were they you know they said they were very hesitant to to release an album in lockdown you know without being able to tour it and without you know because I think the mantra that you hear a lot and I'm not gonna sit here and say whether it's true or not but many people say that you know back in the day you tour to promote the record whereas now you release a record to promote the tour um and I think many people have been um hesitant to release albums in, in lockdown but the response I've heard has been you know pretty good from fan bases and things like that so you know you guys release more than a record a month which you know for a small operation is pretty impressive um, so, so what's that like, you know, in lockdown and out of lockdown under normal, you know, as you know, as a small operation releasing multiple albums a, a month, you know, that, that's, that sounds like a bit of a tall order. Yeah, like it's, it's pretty like busy, but the thing is, because I've been doing it for so long, um, I feel like I have my sort of routines and I have my checklists. It's like, it's just about organizing yourself and just making sure you're on top of your calendar so nothing like slips through the cracks. Um, we have like so there's two of us full time and then we have two freelancers that don't have anything that we don't have time to do so that really helps um and yeah there's like it's quite simple to sort of like set it up once you kind of got into the routine of things you kind of almost feel like not a conveyor but as if like we automate everything but it kind of just sort of becomes muscle memory to make sure everything's on you know up to scratch um yeah it's, it's uh keeps you on your toes that's for sure yeah and what, and what does that process look like you know you're obviously in a band yourself um for an artist you know you know let's say there's obviously going to be some aspiring artists watching this um so what does that process look like for them you know that you, you know they've given you they've handed over their their you know maybe their life's work and their debut record um you know what does that entail for them working with a with a label like church road um so basically like the first stage is getting the contracts um, sorted and just making sure everyone's in agreement of what to expect um, I think that's really important so there's never any 
you know, any discrepancies or anything like that. Um, and then from then we need uh, to get things rolling. We need artwork, we need masters. And depending what format we press on, it's usually like uh, CD, vinyl and digital. So there's different masters for each one. Um, and we need things like band promos. So like, you know, a little tip there, like print magazines hate black and white photos, always color, good, like sort of like, um, kind of variation even if it means you go do one photo shoot and just change your shirt just make it look different um and you know like sort of band bio and things like that and then from then we um we get it sent off to production and usually we have like a test master for the vinyl um and yeah and that gets pressed at the moment vinyl delays are about nine months but usually only takes three months um so yeah it's just from there really and then like our job as a label is to make sure that press are aware of it uh whether we do it on in-house or hire someone external depends on the projects um and then yeah so we set it up on things like spotify we make sure all the playlists like playlist editors know about the album um and yeah and the band's job from then on really is just making sure that they post about their album frequently enough on social media and uh when shows are back hopefully play some shows um well you spoke there about distribution and obviously it's different forms obviously the old-fashioned way shall we say of pressing records and physically distributing and obviously digital distribution um is obviously and we're just gonna i think we're gonna talk um to this about about this with everybody that we speak to um but it seems to be and, and it's, it's just gonna be interesting to get everybody's different perspective or perspectives on it but um spotify playlisting it seems to just be this, I said in, a, in another chat we did, this mythical beast, you know, nobody knows how to crack it. From an independent label, you know, who um, may or may not have direct ties to Spotify. Um, how do you how do you find that process, you know, of distributing? Obviously, you guys go through a distributor who then give it to the streaming platforms. But what, what is that relationship like? And can you shed any light whatsoever for the people watching on, on how that process works and what it's like for you, for you and your artists? So playlisting is a very mixed bag. Um, it's important not to get disheartened if you don't get on the editorial playlist. It's not a reflection of the music. It's just a pure reflection of someone probably didn't even have enough time to listen to it. So the thing is with like uh, editorial playlists, I found through the years that actually it's the algorithm playlists that are what you want to go for. So algorithm playlists are things like New Music Friday, um, Release Radar, uh there's artist radio so all those things you're automatically on them just as long as you pitch it to them and basically those playlists are like related to who your followers are so really it's about building your followers on instagram um, sorry on spotify and apple music and things like that and then you actually get a lot more streams um from those playlists and editorial editorial playlists you obviously you get it's good for discovery and they're important to get but if you don't get them it's not the end of the world um and also like even post campaign like you can only pitch it when it's new but if you do the legwork and you sort of keep getting people to like come to your spotify profile apple music deezer whatever platform um eventually like the editors will notice like spikes in your plays and then you'll you might even get a, an editorial playlist like two years after your album's out. But then once you're on their radar, it got, gets a lot easier because um, they know to look out for you. Um, but it's all, it's basically, um, and it's an amalgamation of everything. Like you need good press, you need to be touring. Like it's not just sort of like you can sit at home and like just hope to get that one playlist and you're gonna be big. That's like, it rarely happens if at all. Um, so there's plenty of things you can get on with and like, you know, I've had it before. Our bands have been a bit upset with like lack of like support, but it's not a reflection of your music or anything. And you can always get them on the next album or, you know, later on. So like I know an artist who's gotten really big on Spotify. I think like two years after an album's out, like all of a sudden all the playlist has kind of cottoned onto their music and you know, now they're big on Spotify. So yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. No, I mean, I think it's difficult at the moment because it seems it seems to be like, you know, for young artists, it's, it's how they're quantifying their success or, you know, validating their music. And, and it's difficult because it's, as I say, it is a, a mystery to, to so many. So for, for Church Road, just just to clarify, are, are you do you encourage artists just to pitch through the Spotify for artist system or is there do you go through your distributor? Is there a process there which is a bit more behind the scenes? 
Um, so actually, little tip. So Spotify like it when the artists do it themselves. Um, they, they prefer to have a direct connection because the whole reason why they've closed it off, like having relationships with um, labels and things like that is because they don't want, they want to discourage nepotism, like which is rife in the industry. So in theory, it should be better because like, you know, young unsigned artists can in theory get a lot of support from Spotify without having a label. Um, but, uh, I'm trying to think now. but yeah, like I guess it's pitch it to your, um, pitch it yourself pretty much. Um, but also I think it's handy as well. Like if you do have a label before going ahead and pitching it, just run the pitch through them. Cause like, um, they like to know things like when you're touring or like hoping to tour, I guess at this point. Um, and also just like a bit about like any publications, like especially big ones, like say for example, Pitchfork have covered you mentioned that. And also say how you're going to promote Spotify on Apple Music as a platform, because um, that's what they're mainly interested in, is like how they're going to you're going to bring more people to Spotify. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. That is definitely the the best answer I've ever had to that question. <laughs> Not just doing this event, but just generally, you know, speaking to people about it. Um, yeah, I've learned more about playlisting there in you know a few minutes than I have in the last year. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, Spotify, they will be keeping track of your numbers, um, your followers and your streams and things like that. Um, how do you feel, you know, a young band or, you know, a, a band, an independent band, young or old, if they approach Church Road Records or, or a similar label, how, how much do you look at their numbers and what they're up to already? And um, something that people talk about very often is the artist's story, quote unquote. How important is that to a label or, you know, is it just the songs, are you just looking for a great, you know, batch of songs and it doesn't matter if you've got a hundred monthly listeners or a thousand, or is it, oh, what do you have in the pipeline for us to work with? Our label, because we work from, I work with very new artists as well as established ones. I don't think numbers are as important of a consideration as to how good the quality of the music is. Like, I think number one is just make sure you have a good sound recording first. And also artwork is a massive thing. Like if you can't be subjective of your own like artwork, like if you're going to walk into H&B or a record store and you see an artwork and it's not going to make you look at it more, then maybe reconsider it. Because I think artwork is super important. And like as much as it's like nice to like throw the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, it's still so important, especially with like the amount of competing artwork. Like just think if like it would sit well in Rough Trade or wherever your target record store is. Um, uh, but yeah, like we look at like the amount of effort that goes into things. Like, so it's a lot of money to release a record and sometimes you never know how well a record's going to do. So the more you see a band who really genuinely like care about their sort of perception, whether it's like on, you know, social media, like regularly posting, like are they just doing low res screenshots of their stuff or are they actually bothering to do nice graphics? and just sort of doing everything they can already to promote their band, then it's gonna be more attractive to a label like me because I'm like, oh, they already, you know, they're already doing well and sort of things like that. And I can trust them to sort of like keep up with that momentum um, when we release the albums, basically. Well, I think that's in many respects, you know, no disrespect to anybody watching and perhaps there are, you know, people watching with great numbers, but I think, you know, that is gonna be encouraging for people to hear because I think a lot of the time, people you know maybe they overanalyze the numbers um and i think you know it's difficult um especially when spotify in particular they are so um statistically heavy you know you've got your monthly listeners in the top right you've got all your streams you've got how many people are listening in quebec you know and and i think you, you might have a good um you know I, I know for the case of my band at the moment um we have a decent amount of streams but on the desktop version of spotify when you go to the locations you know the lower the lower numbers that there's probably like four people in you know in cows on the isle of Wight, and i think because they're so statistically driven um and in the cold light of day um it, it can look you know maybe not negative but maybe not quite as impressive um as as you'd hope so i think that you know as i said that's going to definitely be encouraging for someone for, for, for people to hear coming from you who's obviously running yeah running a successful indie label um you you, talk, you spoke there about artwork and i think do you think you know again on on this concept of of artists approaching labels um and obviously i'd, I'd like to say for people watching church road obviously 
is, is quite a heavy, um, more rocky label, but this is obviously completely fluid. This obviously all this applies um, to, to any genre. Um, do you think when you're approaching a label as an artist, um, it's important or not important or desirable from a label perspective to you know perhaps have a, a, an album maybe recorded already independently and artwork done already, um, or does the label want to be involved in that creative process? Uh, I think it's different label to label, but for me, I like to leave as much of the creative process to the band as possible. Um, I think like me personally, I prefer a finished product because if it's like, I don't feel like demos really do an album justice, especially if you just record it at home and you know for a fact you're going to go to a good studio to record it. I just and like, and as much as you as the artist know what it's going to sound like in your head, like I think people on the outside won't and like you could run the risk of being turned down um you know if it's like a really bad recording and doesn't you know doesn't sound as good um I think you're better off a lot of the time sort of pre-recording it properly absolutely yeah I mean I've spoken like I say to artists before and like, like you say I think it definitely heavily depends from label to label um but I think you know in this in the you know where the music industry is at, at the moment I think the whole um, concept you know you can do things from home now it's not you know a big ask to get get some artwork done or even you know some home demos can sound awful but I know many many of you know my peers so to speak bands they can all get really good demos at home um, so what's the, what's the process of that like so let's say a band comes to you um, with a with a perhaps maybe nearly finished album or at least recorded well album and some artwork um, and you're into it what is, what's the process from there? Because obviously lots of people do view record labels as banks um, and they want they want your money to go to go up, get the advance and make the album. So obviously having an album done already goes against the grain of perhaps what people's preconceptions or misconceptions of a record label. So so an, an artist comes to you with a finished album and some decent artwork. What is the, what is the process like from there? Um, so <laughs> I'm going to preface this with like, there's not really any money in music anymore. Like. So that it's very rare um, to have a label that will give you the big advances. I, I don't, I've never, I haven't heard of any label doing advance over us, you know, like there's no more million pound ones that I know of, do you know what I mean? Especially in our sort of lower circles. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think having like, sort of like having that in mind, like with smaller labels like ours, like, so we, for example, like, we, we sort of expect the band to sort of pay for the recording and we'd pay for things like marketing and things like that. Um, but obviously this once again depends, they was label, you might get picked up by Universal and they might give you a quarter of a million advance. I mean, that's great, you know, but like, I think for small independent labels, the budget's a lot smaller, cash flow's not there. Cause uh, obviously, you know, the sales of like vinyl and stuff has dipped since, you know, back in the day um it's picking up for sure but you know i think you can also um record albums pretty cheap these days as well um there's so many like especially if you're in a music university if you're an artist start getting in contact with the producers so a lot of them are so talented like you know a lot of them come out of music universities already sounding brilliant um you know you make take advantage of it start networking early on within university um because that's the thing like you know you don't want to be priced out of being in a band um but there's also a lot of grants as well you can get as prs um who like are funded by like the lottery and arts council england um there's like bpi exports and stuff that help you go on tour like abroad um so there are quite a few sort of like little funding places that you can go to i used my student loan for our band yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be plenty of people here doing that. I mean, I'm leaving uni shortly. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I've chucked lots of money around from my student loan for the band. I'm not going to go into specifics. It'll be embarrassing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think completely. I think, you know, like I say, I've heard from lots of people that, you know, we got we basically got signed um, because we had our record done already. Um, and I think, you know, that is that is something that that's happening at the moment. So you spoke, you said earlier, um, you know, sometimes you, you'll do PR in-house, sometimes you'll go, you'll source out. We spoke to um, Jamie and Chris from Wall of Sound PR. I don't know if you're familiar, um, but we had a really good chat about PR. And they they were, you know, they said you can come to us and do it. Um, but, you know, we do encourage you to try it yourself first because you don't know 
um, the results that you're going to get. I think you know PR is is, is an interesting topic, and you, you can end up throwing loads of money at it, um, like I have with my student loan, um, or you can do it yourself, or you know a, a label like yours can can do it in house. What, what is it, how does it differ doing it in house? How successful can you be doing it in house, either as a label um, or as an independent artist, or you know outsourcing to to you guys like Chris and Jamie and Wall of Sound? Um, I think it depends. So like as from the label point of view, um, if I have a new band that I don't know how things are going to go or they've had no groundwork put put in already, I tend to do it in-house just because, um, you know, like I end up going drinking with a lot of like the magazines and stuff. So I have good relationships there. So it makes more sense to, you know, not spend lots of money on the record so that, that we make more money and so does the band because obviously everything's done on a profit split. So the less money we spend, the more money people get. So um, for that, we sort of like start building like a reputation with press. Um, you know, we've had like lots of great success. Like we've been, you know, got bands on end of year album lists and things like that. Um, the only time we'd outsource PR is if the band already has a pre-existing relationship or there, I feel like there's um, the PR person can do a much better job than I could. So for example, I have a lot of good contacts in heavy metal um, however, some of our bands are sort of more indie centric. So for them, I would hire out because like things like the indie magazines, like uh, The Wire, um, i to think who else, like Upset and like places like that. They're very, they're very insular and like it's quite hard to sort of, I, I have never met them or anything like that. So it automatically a PR person is going to get a better response than I can. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, it is so, oh, you know, do it yourself, do it yourself. And I think, you know, things like PR, they're quite, they're, as you say, upset and, and publications like that, they can be quite insular. And for someone who doesn't have the contacts you have, PR, you know, and magazines and blogs as a whole isn't quite an insular little world. So I think it is difficult. Um, kind of on the topic of like indie um, artists and being independent, um, obviously, I think you should talk a little bit about it because I think it's a really cool concept. You do your church road, you do a little monthly subscription. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, we, with my old label, we found we were doing a, a release a month um, and it gets quite scary financially because you know, the final is very expensive. Um, so what we, ha- what we found was that we had a lot of customers who would like buy everything that we released. And I mean, everything, every color, you know, anything that we would release, they would pick up. So um, Bandcamp released this subscription service, which I think is brilliant. Um, uh, So basically it's uh, the same set price a month, including shipping. Um, And they automatically get uh, the new release that month. Uh, And we have three tiers. We have digital, CD and vinyl. Um, And obviously they're cheaper reflecting what what one you pick. Um, So yeah, we'd use that and it's like been amazing because I'll be honest, like as a label, it's impossible to write, or, well, almost impossible to budget because you never know how well you're going to do. So having like that set monthly income is like a lifesaver because it means I can, I take a punt on records that I think are really good and I love, but I don't think they'll sell that well. And it's like created this really awesome sort of platform where I can like sort of take risks on really excellent bands. Um, and I also, I already have like, um, you know, an X amount of pre-orders and also the people who subscribe are like really big fans of the label and they like to sort of brag about what releases they've got, which in turn is more promotion for the album. So I think it's great. Like, so as a result, I took it onto my new label to do that. Um, but yeah, big fan of Bandcamp for that. Yeah, and I think the reason I think it's going to, like, that is such an interesting point, and for people watching, like, that's not a completely irrelevant thing to ask, because I was going to say, draw the parallel between that and a, a service like Patreon. Obviously, you mentioned you've got your tier system, and I know of a few artists that are making really decent, as you say, um, consistent monthly incomes from a service like Patreon, which I think is a relatively new thing, as, and particularly in the pandemic, I've seen people really capitalising on their fan base and like we said earlier perhaps people's generosity as they don't know what to do with with their money that they're not spending um so for an artist you know perhaps like a grassroots level artist and, and you know we can move up the tiers how useful is, is something like that going to be to them you know do you think as a practically new band getting your friends and family at first to give you five quid a month on patreon is effectively a start to getting a wage from being in a band 
Yeah, so I've so I've gone done a whole 360 on Patreon. So I so my band use Patreon now as well since the pandemic. So I used to dislike the idea of asking even more of our fans because I feel like they did a lot for us already by coming to the shows and things like that. But I feel my uh, my opinion on that has been forced to change because live shows have been absolutely decimated and that. And it, I felt like with a lot of bands, it made you realize how fragile the ecosystem of the music industry was. Like every artist only makes money from live because like streaming doesn't make you much, record sales don't make you much. It's all about merch and ticket sales. So when that happened, I noticed like a lot of other bands doing the same thing. I think a good example in the heavy music world is like While She Sleeps, like they do like a really good Patreon and it's gone really well for them. Um, so Patreon's really good if you've got a lot of extra content that you're like wanting to release on a good platform um, and also yeah like talking about making that monthly income like you know sort of almost fixed or as fixed as you can make it if it's if it's monthly rolling thing but um, so yeah um, as grassroots bands I mean I, you can start on Patreon but it might be worth trying to like build a fan base first um, just so you're not relying too heavily on like those core people. Um, I think like if you can go to shows and things like that um, and build up your like sort of reputation before going to Patreon rather than being sort of like a direct a crowdfunded band from the beginning, um, it might work a bit better. But yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends. Music. If you're like, I don't know, an uh, electronic dance artist who doesn't really like tour at all or like, you know, it's mainly online based and of course it makes sense to mainly do Patreon, but for sort of bands and like touring musicians, I think sort of getting out there and starting to tour first is probably a bit better. And you say that, like you said, rather than being crowdfunded from the start, which is a different animal in itself. What about, and I, and I know a few indie labels, um, you know, probably at a similar uh, level to Church Road, who are more than happy for their bands to completely crowdfund records. Um, how do you feel about that? Because I remember, um, unfortunately it didn't happen, but my band, and I we were supposed to go out and play South by Southwest this year. Um, and the thing that was thrown around a lot was crowdfunded, crowdfunded. And I didn't want to because I was far too scared of failure, you know, on the little um, loading yeah. bar, having a like hundred quid out of 5,000. That, that idea just made me feel so terrible about it. What, what do you think about, the, about that as a, um, as a method? Um, I think it's really good when you're already established. So for example, a lot of venues like the Blackheart in Camden in London they like saved themselves by doing a crowdfunder um so like and I know I think Protest the Hero crowdfunded their album that was really successful but I feel crowdfunders are only really good when you have that existing relationship with fans and have been there for a while because that's the thing once if it's not fully funded then it fails and that could be quite a bad look and like you said quite embarrassing um, so I'm not I'm not adverse to it, and I think it works really well for some people. Um, but I think yeah, be cautious because it's, it's quite yeah. If you don't reach, reach your goal, it might be a bit bit of a blow to the ego. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Maybe that was my issue. I've got my ego is far too delicate for crowdfunding. Um, <laughs> well, look, it's, I'm having such a good time, and you know, I wish we could go on for long. You know, to to wrap up, is there any you know you you help bands and navigate their careers? Um, that is kind of your role uh, to a point as a record label. Is there any tips or tricks, you know, on the on the topic of making money um, from a band? Because as you know, that as you say that there's not much money in music. Is there anything that you've picked up along the way? That you, you know, oh, I don't know. This band released a pair of socks. You know, Palm Reader released a pair of socks and they made two grand from it. You know, something like that. Um, I think first off, like you have to be doing it not for money because. You, you just have to love doing it. And I think if you do it for the money, you'll make the wrong decisions in terms of where you put your money or what shows you play. I think having that genuine like love for playing live, I think that will carry you very far. Um, in terms of money, um, I have yet to live off my band, so I have no idea on that. Um, but I think like just things like merch, like just make sure like with t-shirts and stuff, when you start off, don't do more than 25 to 50 do one color print, like black and white t-shirts, like they're nice and cheap. You can make a lot of money on them. Um, you know, don't spend your money that you make on it on beers. Just try and keep the band fun within the band, like no matter what. Um, uh, don't be afraid to sort of like, you know, apply for funding. 
is like although like the England's not as good as as Europe for funding that it is there and I don't feel like people know it about it enough um so sort of like try and apply for help um and or just uh not that I recommend this just get 0% credit cards like I did <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean that's a great financial tip I think it's like a um it's almost like not to say that you, you can't do it or, or to say that, you know, music as a career is an unrealistic expectation, but I feel like it's almost to hear somebody like you, you know, who, who is, you know, in a successful band and running a successful label. I think it's important to hear that, you know, being in a band, you know, you're, you're not living from your band. I don't think there's many bands, some of my favourite bands, I know they're not. And I think that is the music industry that we're in at the moment. And perhaps your root of your your balancing act if you like of you know having your band and also having a record label I think it's the way that many people are going to go and it's almost the new the new music industry you know yeah and I'm not saying it's not going to change but I just think you're setting yourself up for such disappointment um if you really think you're going to sort of I mean I'm not going to say like there are some people who do explode and get huge but I just think it's such a shame to get disheartened when really you should just be really enjoying those little small wins like hitting the extra hundred on followers and things because it's all really exciting and you know just actually like because I'm really guilty of this myself like when you're in a band and you get that festival and you're like cool what next what next and you're constantly looking into the future and then like after a while like you kind of realize oh I'm not like really enjoying the now kind of thing as cheesy as it sounds I think it's like that for everything in life you just have to enjoy the moment and not to worry too much about what the future holds Absolutely. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, that feels like a great way to wrap it up, but is there anything else you, that you want to say, you know, or, you know, any records that you want to talk about coming out on Church Road anytime soon? I'm trying to think. Well, we've got uh, all of our current releases are on our website. I won't bore you with them just in case uh, our listeners aren't metal centric. <laughs> coming out. Um, yeah. Cheers for listening. And Absolutely. Don't be well, by the pandemic and Brexit it will work out because everyone always needs music. Well, that feels like a perfect way, as I say, to end this. Justine, thank you so much. That was so much fun. Um, thank you. Thank you so much to Justine and Church Road for coming along. And yeah, that was a great chat. Um, this has been Soundcheck for Brave Island. And as we said before, Brave Island is a new um, creative platform for young people on the Isle of Wight. To get involved, go to braveisland.uk and just have a scroll through. Um, lots of the opportunities, they're all free. Some of them are even paid. Um, and thank you very much for, for watching this. This is Soundcheck.